nails in your hands, the nails in your feet, oh, they tell me how you love me. The thorns on your brow, oh, they tell me how you bore so much pain to love me. And when the heavens pass away, all your scars will still remain, and forever they will say just how much you love me. So I want to say, forever my love, forever my heart, forever my love. Forever my love, forever my heart, forever my life is yours, it's yours. The nails in your hands, the nails in your feet, oh, they tell me how you love me. The thorns on your brow, oh, they tell me how you bore so much shame to love me. And when the heavens pass away, all your scars will still remain. And forever they will say just how much you love me. So I want to say Forever my love Forever my heart Forever my life is yours Forever my love Forever my heart Forever my life is yours It's yours The nails in your hands, the nails in your feet, oh, they tell me how you love me. The thorns on your brow, oh, they tell me how you bore so much pain to love me. And when the heavens pass away, all your scars will still remain And forever they will say Just how much you love me So I want to say Forever my love Forever my heart Forever my life is yours Forever my love Forever my heart Forever my life is yours Forever my love Forever my heart Forever my life is yours It's yours Good morning. Do you remember the key thing that Jesus said about truth in John chapter 8? I heard it a few times. It says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Which means if you don't know the truth, you can't be free. 
So there are basically two parts of our minds. There's the part of our mind that is factual and logical and this is how it is. And there's a part of our mind that's feelings and emotion. And when we feel good, we don't really worry about truth because we feel good. But when we don't feel good, we can easily get discouraged. And one of the things that came up again this week with somebody I was visiting, and it comes up regularly as a pastor, it comes up in my own heart and life, is this, I'm following Jesus, I think I'm following Jesus, I think, I hope I'm a Christian, but I'm not sure. When he comes, am I going to be... And when we think that way, those thoughts go up and down with our feelings, right? On a good day, it's okay, and on a bad day, it's not. Truth without feelings is empty. Feelings without truth is dangerous. So today we're going to look at the truth as the Bible presents it. So we're going to start in the book of Hebrews. We're celebrating today what Jesus did, so let's find out exactly what that was. Okay? The book of Hebrews, for those of you who don't know or aren't familiar, is the New Testament book that explains all of the things that happened as far as the religious system of the Old Testament. The offering of sacrifices over and over and over. Now you remember Cain and Abel, right? Anybody out there? Yeah? Right? What did Cain, what was Cain's mistake? He had the altar. Well, before that. Before he killed his brother. He had an altar. He was worshipping. But what did he decide to do with the offering, with the sacrifice? He switched it out, right? Now, Abel, he didn't do that, right? He kept the right offering, the right altar. He had the right system. Now, when Jesus came, he came to the Jewish nation, and they were still having altars, and they were still offering lambs. They still had the right system. And yet, when the man came, that all the system pointed to, what did they do with him? They rejected him. Well, how did that happen? If if, if If everything's right on the truth side, how could that happen? Anybody got an answer? See, everything wasn't right on the truth side. They came to believe that doing it right was what was going to save them. Instead of remembering that what they were doing was pointing to the the one who would save them. And here's the truth about it. If you think about it, when your feelings go down and you start to doubt, your relationship with Jesus. It's because of something that you did or you thought or you felt that you knew was out of harmony with God. And you started basing your security with Jesus on on you. Is that where it is? So Isaac read for us. We'll come back to it. First verse we're going to look at is Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27. And I encourage you to open your Bibles, even though it's on the screen, if for no other reason than if you want to find it later, your chances of doing so are greater if you've actually looked it up physically yourself. So Hebrews is talking about what the priest did in the Old Testament, and he's talking about Jesus in comparison. It says, who does Jesus, the who is Jesus, does not need daily or every day, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because this he did once for all when he offered up... Now, when I grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know what I pictured? And maybe you're not different. I pictured that every time I asked God for forgiveness that Jesus went back into the holy, most holy place and said, you know, Dan messed up again. Can we fix it? But that's not the 
It's not the truth. That Jesus did it once for all. John the Baptist looked at Jesus when he first came and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world once for all. You say, well, that just sounds too easy and too crazy. 9 verse 12. I encourage you to read what's in between. We're just, we don't have time. So here's a good one. Saved by the, by the blood. Can you read the fine print? Can't read the fine. Let's zoom in on it. Can you read it now? By his own blood he entered in into the having obtained eternal redemption for us. So if you're worrying about your eternal salvation, that was secured 2,000-ish years ago. You're worrying about something getting done that's already done. If that wasn't close enough, here it is a little closer, getting grainy because we're in too close. By his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9, verse 12. Here it is in the NIV. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered into the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Now, some of you say, well, NIV, that's the never-inspired version. What does the real Bible say? Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And you can look up any translation you want. You can look up in the Greek, like I did. It doesn't change. Jesus did it once. Hebrews 10. By the which we all are, what does that fancy word mean? What does that fancy word mean? Made, I heard it, made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. It's not your asking or anybody else's asking that takes away your sin. It's Jesus, once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of of God. Now does that sound like way too easy and once saved, always saved and it's just he does it all and there's nothing we can do about it? One offering has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now that's a mouthful. If you were here last week in the afternoon we talked about how perfect do we need to be. This Hebrews 10.14 One offering has perfected, past tense, for all time, no change, for those who are, that's a progressive verb, who are being sanctified. How many of you can put up your hand this morning and say, I'm perfect? And the Bible admits that you're not perfect. It says you are being made perfect. But while you're being made perfect, you're already perfect. That's what it says. Isn't that what it says? Tracy and I were in Germany quite a few years back. Nathaniel had barely been born, so it's quite a while ago now. I think it's the cleanest country I've ever seen. And we were in Berlin, and they were fixing the whole facade of a massive building. It's probably like 12 stories high. And they had done something I had never seen before. They made a canvas. The whole front of the building was a massive canvas. 
of a picture of what the building was going to be when it was finished. And the scaffolding and the workers were behind the canvas, making the building become what the canvas said it already, it already was. When God looks at us, the moment that we say, Jesus, I don't want the world, I don't want Satan, I don't want evil, I want you. The moment we make that choice, everything Jesus did applies to us. And he doesn't need to do it over and over and over again. Every time you make a mistake, he did it once for all. Several times in my ministry, and I've thought about doing it myself, people have come to me and said, you know, I've done this and this and this. Should I be, I'm thinking about being baptized again. Should I do that? And so I wrestled with it. I studied. I looked. And and finally I came to the realization, no. No. Can you imagine the chaos and how busy I would be if all of the married couples every time they had a bad day, said, Pastor, book us in. We're going to get married again. Marriage doesn't start and stop with good days and bad days. You get married once for all. And the only time you ever need to get married again is if you deliberately choose and say, I'm done. I'm not married anymore. This is over. And if you've done that with Jesus and said, Jesus, I don't want you anymore, and then you came back years later and changed your mind, then maybe baptism is, rebaptism is a good idea. Other than that, Jesus died for you once, for all. Who do you think gets in our hearts and our heads and says, Are you sure? Are you sure you're a Christian? Are you sure? That Jesus can apply his blood to you? You got it, Catherine. All right, let's apply. That. Now we've done the technical teaching. Let's put it in, into real life situation, into a story. So this is John chapter... Anybody know? There's got to be a scholar out there somewhere. John chapter... 13. What's around? This is Jesus on the left. He's probably whiter than he should be. And his hair is probably longer than it was. But that's Jesus. On the other side is Peter. What's around Jesus' waist? Towel. And he comes to Peter in John 13 with the towel and the water. And he says, before Jesus can do anything, Peter says... Lord, you think you're going to wash? Uh Uh-uh. No, no way. Why did Peter say that? You know, Adventists, we wash feet. We're going to do it here soon. We're weird. But there's a reason why we do it. And today you're going to understand even more why we do it. All Peter knew at that moment was... That's a servant's job. And if anyone in this room shouldn't be doing it, it's it's Jesus. So I'm going to do the right thing and the noble thing and say, "Uh uh-uh, you're not washing mine. I'm not going to subject you to that kind of servitude. What did Jesus say? Not, Not yet, Catherine. You're getting ahead of us. Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing, you do not understand now. Does Peter have truth right now? No, he's being dictated by his feelings. I feel like Jesus shouldn't have to do this, so I'm saying no. But Jesus says, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but you will know after this. When you become a Christian, guess what? Do you know everything Jesus wants you to know? Do you know everything you should know? No. Does that change the fact that Jesus died for you once for all? No. Peter said to him, you will never 
washed my feet. Now, my father-in-law is here today, Tracy's dad. He told me when we got married, he says, there's two words you should never use in your marriage. I've failed many times. Never and always. Peter said you will never wash my feet. What did Jesus say? Before we go on, is Peter the only person that ever argued with Jesus? Have you argued with Jesus? Jesus answered him and said, If I do not wash you, you will have no part with me. That's pretty big. So what did Peter say? Now, would you say Peter was the kind of person who was dictated more by truth or by feelings? Feelings. He was always blurting off before he had thought about what he was saying. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So Peter's feelings rise up. Well, I don't want to be left apart from Jesus. So, so Lord, not my feet only. Wash my hands, my head. Wash everything. Get the pressure washer out and just hose me down. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you, Peter, are clean. In this same chapter, the very same. At the very same table, in the very same meal, Jesus looked Peter in the eye and said, Peter, you are going to deny me. Your feelings are going to override your senses, and you're going to panic, and you're going to deny me. But let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many rooms. Peter, you're going to betray me. You're going to cheat on me. You're going to tell people with cursing that you don't know me. And it's not going to change our relationship one bit. Crazy. See, if I did what Peter's about to do, I would think after that, I better get baptized again. But before it all happened, Jesus said, no, you don't need to do that, Peter. You're already, you're clean. So why the feet? Why the feet? Our feet carry us everywhere we, we go, right? His feet carried him into that courtyard where he cursed and swore and said he didn't know Jesus. When we wash each other's feet, it's a symbol not only of humility, of servitude, but of the fact that Jesus, in Jesus we are clean. And every little thing we do that makes our feet dirty along the way, he's already got it covered once for all. <clears throat> now, what did Jesus say to Peter? He says, you don't understand now, but you will understand later. Do you think Peter figured it out? Do you want to see that he figured it out? Do you, want, do you want it to be my opinion or do you want to see it? I hope you want to see it because my opinion really doesn't matter for much. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ, this is Peter writing his, his letter, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Did I say that? I didn't say that. Say, so, Pastor, you're making it sound too... What did Jesus say about his yoke? My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And there are plenty of preachers on YouTube, on the internet, in the Adventist church, who will be happy to make it harder. But to do so, they have to deviate.
from the simplicity of everything Jesus was teaching. Because the mistake the Jews made, they thought it was the system that was saving them. And they forgot what the system was pointing to. And so when the one came who it was pointing to came, they rejected him and said, no, no, we're good. We have it figured out. We have the truth. Who says that today? We're people of the, the truth, the book. But if you're adding anything, then you're not people of the truth. You're people of the burden. And let me tell you something. This adding to what Jesus said, you know when it started? Before Eve ever ate the fruit. She said, the Lord told us, we can't eat it. We can't even touch it. But if you go back, Jesus never said you can't touch it. We're always adding Hebrews 10, 17 says, Their sins and iniquities will I remember. Now where remission of these is, there is no more. What's that mean? What's it mean? Their sins and iniquities I will remember. I don't remember them. I don't remember them. And if I don't remember them, why would I go back into the most holy place day after day and present my blood to God again and again and again and again? There's no, I don't need to offer it again. It's offer it for what? For what? You know, I grew up in Quebec, and in Quebec there's a Catholic church. It doesn't pretty well, anywhere you go, you can see a Catholic steeple from somewhere. And I'm not here to pick on Catholicism because all Catholicism is is Christianity that was simple that became a mess. And we all did it together. So let's not pick on them. And the Roman Catholic Church is there open every day. Did you know that? You come to our church in the middle of the week, chances are it's going to be locked. You can't get in. But the Roman Catholic, they're open all the time. Do you know why? Because they actually want you to go to Mass every day. Because in their understanding and teaching, Jesus didn't do it once for all. You've got to do it again and again and again to keep people in constant uncertainty. Because people who are constantly uncertain are afraid, and people who are afraid are easier to control. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, and you will be free Indeed. So we're going to separate now for our foot washing, and I hope when you do it today, you'll see it from an even brighter light, that we are clean. So our ladies out and...